I go to Hong Kong, far from dense jurisdiction. In a memorable scene from The Dark Knight, the mob is arguing about what to do about the police trying to seize all of their money, as well as the threat of Batman. Lau comes up with this plan to have the mob give him all of the money so that he can travel to Hong Kong because the Chinese will never extradite a national, putting him beyond the reach of the Gotham police. But then the Joker says, And as for uh, the television's so-called plan, Batman has no jurisdiction. The Joker's prediction turns out to be accurate. The Gotham City Police Department can't arrest Lau when he's in China, but Batman can do whatever he wants. In having no official jurisdiction, Batman has jurisdiction everywhere. It's pretty clear to me that the scene is making a statement about Bush-era foreign policy. That's a bog-standard reading of that movie. The film constructs the scenario where Batman needs to rendition someone from another country in order to keep Gotham slash America safe. A scenario that comments on the Bush administration's use of that technique. It asks the audience to question how far a reach the American government should have in world affairs. It's saying, you know, maybe doing things by the book isn't enough, and we need someone to go beyond what we consider ethical to get the job done, yada yada yada. There's a similar thing going on in the recently released Falcon and the Winter Soldier TV series. Take it easy. You might want to fight Bucky before you tangle with the Dora Milaje. The Dora Milaje don't have jurisdiction here. The Dora Milaje don't have jurisdiction here. The Dora Milaje don't have jurisdiction. So for the first time ever, I went a little bit viral on Twitter. And now I'm going to do what any self-respecting YouTuber would do in this moment, and that's make an entire video explaining in detail what was more or less self-evident in a single sentence. Because you gotta monetize those hot takes. But in all seriousness, the reason I wanna do this is that the tweet got to dip a toe into some complex ideas surrounding American imperialism that could use a little more explanation. So with all of that in mind, the most important thing I want you to take away from this video is that you should be following me on Twitter. In episode four of the show, three different factions are arguing over what will happen to Baron Zemo. Sam and Bucky have been using Zemo to help with their current investigation, but John Walker, who was recently anointed as the new Captain America, wants to have him arrested, while the Dora Milaje, the elite warriors of Wakanda, want to take him into their own custody. All of these factions converge on an apartment in Latvia, which is when this exchange happens. The Dora Milaje don't have jurisdiction here. The so. Dora Milaje have jurisdiction wherever the Dora Milaje find themselves to be. And five different thoughts hit your brain at once. The first of which is like, um, do you have jurisdiction here, Captain America? The answer is, well, yes, technically. I suppose. So at this point of the story, the world is reeling from a few extremely destructive events. Five years earlier, half of the human population disappeared in a puff of smoke and were then magically popped back into existence. This has led to all sorts of bureaucratic and humanitarian nightmares that this show is exploring the fallout of. Lots of people lost their homes or were stranded in countries they didn't belong to or had to prove they weren't dead. Sam can't get a loan for a business because he hasn't had any income for five years because, you know, he didn't exist. And there are huge refugee camps filled with people affected by all of this, which are managed by the Global Repatriation Council, the GRC. The stated purpose of the GRC is ostensibly to get everything sorted, get it all back the way it was before anything happened. It's an international organization and is given wide reaching powers across the globe that are only ever vaguely defined in the show. But what we know is that new Captain America here isn't just representing the American government, he's an agent of the GRC which means that yes, the text justifies why he has jurisdiction when he is standing in Latvia. The thing is though, this character is wearing the American flag. Everything he does is going to carry political weight and say something about the United States, not just some fictional organization that doesn't have a real world parallel. And John Walker is characterized in such a way that it really wouldn't matter to him if he didn't have legal jurisdiction to be here. He's going to do whatever he feels like at the time. This very episode ends with him murdering an unarmed man in the street. And from that perspective, the critique of American foreign policy is pretty clear. It doesn't matter whether America has jurisdiction or not. America's jurisdiction is everywhere. In How to Hide an Empire, A History of the Greater United States, Daniel Immervar takes a look at the various parts of the world that America has conquered or acquired in some way, but which, for whatever reason, were never fully incorporated into the Republic on equal footing as the 50 states themselves. For Immervar, the existence of these places defines America as an empire. 
Other empires have no issue identifying themselves as empires, but it is important to America that it never calls itself one explicitly. Empires have always been the enemy. America has fought empires throughout its history, and its most popular fictional universe is all about defeating an empire. America self-identifies as a republic, which is supposed to be morally superior to an empire. In a republic, the people are supposed to be free and enfranchised. They have some mechanism to shape their own government rather than simply being ruled. But that's never really been true for all of America like Guam, Puerto Rico, or the Philippines, all of which have occupied ill-defined positions within the American empire at different points of history, controlled by America, but not fully part of it. And the reason for their exclusion is clear. Excluding them maintained white supremacy in the country, barring millions of non-white people from having voting rights. For much of its history, America was obsessed with expansion, but there was a shift in how America handled overseas expansion after World War II. Former colonies like the Philippines were granted independence, and the occupation of some countries like Japan didn't lead to colonization. But America never really left those places either. Rather than trying to control them outright or annexing them, America began maintaining a network of military bases across the globe, which is why Imravar has described America as a pointillist empire. As in, if you tried to draw a map of the country, you'd see the familiar shape of the 50 states, and then a series of smaller and smaller dots. Like in this video by Johnny Harris, where he tries to map every known US military base. Despite the relatively tiny size, America exerts enormous military and economic influence almost everywhere through these bases, and far beyond the capabilities of any other country. Britain and France have some 13 overseas bases between them, Russia has 9, and various other countries have 1. In all, there are probably 30 overseas bases owned by non-US countries. The United States, by contrast, has roughly 800, plus agreements granting it access to still other foreign sites. Dozens of countries host U.S. bases. Those that refuse are nevertheless surrounded by them. The greater United States, in other words, is everyone's backyard. And America's presence in these places hasn't been unanimously welcomed either. There have been numerous protests. Their presence is not benign. They are a key part of America's global power. So with all of that, let's look back at our friend John Walker. Rather than justifying his presence here, it is precisely because Captain America has legal jurisdiction here that strikes at a problematic truth in the real world. And it should make us question why. From what power is that kind of decision reached? Why is it given to an American? In what ways is this coerced because of America's military predominance? The moment flies by so quickly, and yet it feels so natural and obvious that he has the power of the law on his side, which is exactly why the moment should cause reflection. Why have we passively accepted it as natural? It's also what gives the Dora Milaje's retort such bite. The Dora Milaje don't have jurisdiction here. The so. Dora Milaje have jurisdiction wherever the Dora Milaje find themselves to be. Because why shouldn't America's hegemony be challenged? Why are you the only one that gets to play at being world police? It's also not just this scene that is hinting at a critique of American imperialism, but John Walker's entire conception as a character. His purpose in the story is to make Sam and the audience question what they believe the symbol of Captain America, and by extension America in general, are supposed to stand for. Steve Rogers was always presented as the moral center of the Marvel Universe. When he made a decision, the story always considered it morally correct. He stands in for everything that America as a country aspires to be, the values it says it wants to uphold. John Walker is a mockery of this, someone who looks the part but is driven by ego and the desire to dominate more than by the desire to protect. He's short-tempered, self-righteous, and needlessly violent. His presence in the story asks the audience to reflect on America's place on the world stage. This is a somewhat surprising turn for the Marvel Cinematic Universe. A couple years ago, I made a video looking at the cozy relationship the MCU has had with the Pentagon. Essentially, if you want to make a movie that features the American military in any way, then the Pentagon gets to have final say on the script, or you have to make the movie without access to their official uniforms and equipment. This operates as a soft censor on the kinds of movies Hollywood can produce and the kind of critiques it can make about American foreign policy and the military. It also means that a 
lot of movies have functioned as recruitment ads. They are, among other things, military propaganda. And since Falcon and the Winter Soldier begins with a scene heavily featuring the American military, it's likely the scripts passed through the lens of the Pentagon. I can't say that for certain, as I don't have a primary source for that at the moment, but given what I know about how these things work, I can say that it's likely the case. So on the face of it, it's somewhat surprising to have American world policing be lightly critiqued like this in a Marvel story. At the same time, perhaps it's also the reason behind John Walker's extremely rushed redemption arc that has him quipping with the heroes not two episodes after the murders a guy in the street while the world watches scene. I'd be extremely curious to know whether his arc was in any way shaped by the Pentagon, or if his arc is meant as a critique of the Pentagon, the fact that he faces minimal consequences for murdering someone in another country. To me, this raises an interesting question about how these stories handle their politics. And for that, we've got to talk a little bit about Carly Morgenthau and Marvel's new villain problem. A few years ago, one of the most common criticisms against Marvel movies was that they had lackluster villains. Many of them were uncharismatic and forgettable. But in the last few years, Marvel has a new villainous archetype, the leftist, terrorist, Legend of Korra-esque villain. This is going to be my most self-referential video ever. Okay, so back in the ancient times, I made this video praising a particular aspect of the show, The Legend of Korra, which I have since soured on to a degree. The basic idea was that the villains are well written because they have coherent ideologies that the hero has to learn from, and in doing so, the world changes and becomes a better place. Amon is a fraud, but his fight for people without magical abilities to have political power leads to them being enfranchised in the following seasons, for example. Marvel has started writing characters like this. In Spider-Man Homecoming, Adrian Toomes is a blue-collar salvage worker who is right to be angry at the rich and powerful people of the world. Killmonger in Black Panther is a black liberationist who wants to empower the oppressed. And now Carly Morgenthau is an anti-nationalist, anti-capitalist revolutionary. The issue with some of these characters is that the stories don't find ways to question whether their ideas are wrong. Instead, the villains are automatically wrong because they embrace violence. They just love killing people. There's still people in there. This is the only language these people understand. They're all this guy from Rick and Morty. I will kill anyone, anywhere. Children, animals, old people, doesn't matter. I just love killing. Killmonger is Marvel's best version of this trope for a few reasons. First, in Black Panther, the protagonist actually believes in something tangible. He believes in the traditions of Wakanda, and Killmonger challenges those beliefs. All of you are wrong! This isn't the case in Falcon and the Winter Soldier, where Sam doesn't really have beliefs as far as the main political conflict goes, not any beliefs that are unique. His arc is an internal one about living up to the mantle of Captain America, but it isn't like he represents one ideology, whereas Carly represents another, and then they take the best ideas of both to come up with something new. Instead, Sam just knows that violence is bad, so he has to stop the bad guys. You know, with violence. I agree with your fight. I just can't get with the way you're fighting it. At the end of each of these stories, the hero embraces the villain's ideology just without the killing part. But in Black Panther, the heroes actually did have something practical to do about the problems posed by the movie and commit to sending aid to other countries. In Falcon and the Winter Soldier, it's some West Wing style nonsense about giving a speech so good that it'll shame the powerful into utterly abandoning the thing that benefits them and somehow solve the problem without any need for further pressure. Sam tells the elites of the world to do better and then he goes and barbecues while all of the problems in the story are left to linger unanswered. So the show has this very muddled conclusion that seems to do the very opposite of what it wanted to say. The ideologies and practices that the story implicitly condemns, like imperialism, are in the end treated as harmless and welcomed back into the fold. Meanwhile, the ideas the story explicitly agrees with are presented as irrationally violent for most of the time that they are on screen, and then when their ideas are embraced, the show ends before depicting the positives of that ideology and letting the extremist version of it linger longer in the viewer's memory. This is why I'm a little tired of this particular formula. It's not that it's bad exactly, I've just seen it one too many times, and I don't find it very interesting if the only lesson to be learned is violence bad actually. We know violence is bad. The political conflicts in stories like this can be more nuanced than that. So maybe we should stop tarring and feathering the very policies we want to see in the world and giving us stories that justify inaction. And if nothing else, I just want you to remember that you should be following me on Twitter. 
Facebook.com at Sage Hyden. One part of Daniel Imravar's book that I didn't get to talk about too much, but is sort of at the root of America's military base strategy, is the rise of aerial warfare. If you want to learn more about that topic, then I recommend Bombing War, From Guernica to Hiroshima, a documentary you can find on CuriosityStream, the sponsor of this video. CuriosityStream is a subscription streaming service with thousands of documentaries and nonfiction titles to choose from. And right now, when you sign up for CuriosityStream, you also get a subscription to Nebula for free. Nebula is a service I'm building with a bunch of other YouTube channels you might recognize, like Patrick H. Willems and Lessons from the Screenplay. It's a place where creators can make content without having to worry about view numbers or demonetization. Right now, I'm working on a project I think you might like that'll be exclusive to Nebula, so I hope you check the platform out. Click on the link in the description below and get both CuriosityStream and Nebula, and get them at a discount as well. The annual plan with my link is just $14.79, and with that, you're supporting my channel and educational content in general. That's curiositystream.com slash just right. And I also want to thank my patrons for supporting this channel on Patreon. Keep writing, everyone.